Hi, Kevin. Good morning, everybody. Welcome uh, to our meeting. Uh, we haven't had one in a while, uh, but uh, it's good to have everybody back online. I think uh, this is probably the uh, based upon the current status of the uh, governors uh, and, and the national de determinations in COVID. I think this might might be our last uh, virtual uh, meeting, unless we have some other basis for having a vir virtual meeting. So I think we'll have to be going back to in-person meetings uh, in the future. But at any rate, it's great to have everybody. Uh, I'd, I turn it over to uh, Seema for a couple uh, logistical announcements before we proceed with some of the things on the agenda. Yes, thank you, Elliot, and good to see everybody. Um, so this meeting is being recorded. Please use the mute function when you're not speaking. That will help to eliminate any excessive background noise. Um, for any members of the public, if you have a question during the meeting, please use the chat box. Additionally, if you wish to address the committee during the public comment agenda item, you can indicate your desire to do so in the chat box. And for members of the committee when making a motion, please include your name so staff can properly record that. And that concludes my meeting announcements. So Thank you very much. Uh, at this time, I'd ask that staff call the roll, please. Yes. Thomas Gary. Blake Grigsby. Elliot Hartstein. Here. Kevin Ivers. I cannot hear oh, Kevin. Did we lose? Audio. Oh, there you are. Got me. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Renee Patton. Here. Ruth Rosas. Daniel Honigman. Aditya Karan. Here. And Tessa Riley. Here. Great. So we do have a quorum, which is great. And since we do have a new member of the committee, I'd like to invite everybody to briefly introduce themselves. Um, I will just go in the order on my screen and call folks um, names. And if you could just um, give us your name, pronouns, um, and your role, where you work, and maybe where you live, that would be great. So I'll start with Renee. Hey, Renee, um, they, them. I live in Edgewater. My day job is that I work, I'm an aide for NWRD Commissioner Mariana Spropolis. Um, and in my volunteer role, I'm a chair with the Edgewater Environmental Coalition uh, nonprofit. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Renee. Aditya? Hi, I'm Aditya. I represent Will County, and I am currently a PhD student at the University of Illinois. Great. Tessa? Hi everyone, my name is Tessa Riley. Uh, this is my first meeting and I'm super excited to be here. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I live in Lincoln Park and I um, my day job is a energy sustainability and infrastructure public sector consultant for Guidehouse Incorporated. Great, we're excited to have you. Thanks, Tessa. Thank you. All right, Elliot. Hi, I'm Elliot Hartstein. Uh, I've served as uh, chairman of the committee since its inception uh, some time ago, uh, and I was a former uh, CMAP board member and vice chairman board for a number of years and also part of the original formation of the merger uh, that led to the formation of CMAP back in, I believe, 2005. Uh, goes back, goes back a few, goes back a few years. Uh, I'm an, I'm an attorney. Uh, and. Uh, I, uh, he and he and him. Thank you. And Kevin. Kevin Ivers. I'm from Woodstock, Illinois. Um, I work for a uh, construction material distributor in Elmhurst and um, volunteer wise currently involved as the president of the McHenry County Conservation Foundation and pronouns are he and his. Great, thank you so much. And then we can also do CMAP folks. So Jane. 
Hi, Jane Grover. I uh, direct the public engagement for CMAP, she, her pronouns, and it's nice that we're able to gather today. It'll be an interesting meeting. Yes. And again, I'm Samuel Bohab. I'm the liaison for the committee. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm engagement specialist at CMAP, and I live in Lincoln Park. All righty, we can move on to the next item. Thank you. I know uh, the next uh, we're going to uh, ultimately have some. Uh, uh, well, first of all, I'll ask if there's any uh, any agenda changes that anybody has at this time. There are none. Seeing none, we'll move on. Uh, we do have, or we will be having, uh, some executive director announcements uh, when Erin joins us, uh, and we'll come back to that when she uh, joins the meeting. Uh, we do have uh, next, uh, we have some minutes that were never approved uh, because of our lapse of meetings. So I would entertain, first of all, you've all received copies of these minutes uh, with the meeting packet. So I first of all uh, ask for a motion and first of all uh, to approve the minutes of 61422. 22 you know, Elliot, you could if there, there any, if there, if there are any changes or corrections. Yeah, you could probably take them both together. Okay. Are there any yeah. are there any additions or corrections that anybody knows of uh, to the minutes of six fourteen and uh, six fourteen twenty two and six eight twenty one? Seeing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve. This is Kevin Ivers, and I'll make the motion to approve. Is there a second? Seconded. Second. Second. Uh, all in favor? Can I get a name for that second? Who seconded? I, I can get the idea. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. All in favor? Yes. Aye. 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 Great. Does those stand approved? Uh, next, uh, we would. Uh, I don't believe we have any new business. Let's just have something to bring up at this time. Other than that, we'll go back to uh, the uh, proposed meeting schedule. You received that in the mail as well, or, or, or you received it with the agenda rather. And I would uh, ask the, the next meeting, I believe is in August. Uh, and I'd ask for a motion to approve the meeting schedule. Somebody please make a motion. Uh, this is Kevin and I'll make the motion. To is there a second? Somebody please second the motion. I'll second. Thank you. Uh, any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Aye. The meeting schedule stands approved. Uh, the next item uh, is we have a plan of action for regional transit. And I'd like to turn it over to Jane Grover to uh, discuss this particular uh, project. Thanks, Elliot, and uh, thanks, everyone. This is the bulk of our meeting today, uh, is that um, we want to talk with you about a big project that's come to CMAP. Uh, we've been asked by the Illinois General Assembly to, in the face of what looks like a fiscal cliff for public transit in northeastern Illinois, develop a plan and specific recommendations for the future of public transit in Northeastern Illinois. So uh, this was late last year, CMAP has since convened a steering committee, a series of discussion groups as we try to figure out what is the public transit system we want, uh, how do we implement it and how do we pay for it? And in the meantime, well, we've just started a phase of talking to communities and organizations in, this age, in the region uh, to kind of tap into their expertise about to, in answer to those three questions. So we'll take you through uh, kind of a presentation with some background information and there's some live polling in this in this um, in this discussion. So you'll need your cell phones to dial into Mentimeter. Some will show you the, um, the slide for how you dial into Mentimeter. So you can either scan the QR code or someone do you want to explain this? For yes, so that works. Thank you. Jane. Yes, we're going to be using some live polling. So you can either use your phone to scan the QR code and that will take you directly to our Mentimeter, or you can type in on a browser on your computer on your phone, menti.com, 
and type in the code that's on the screen, 13503313. Either way, it will take you there. And then all of our polling will be in that same spot. So as we move through the questions, it will change on your screen. And if you have any issues with that, if you need to type something in the chat, feel free to do that. Um, and I could also post a link in the chat. Why don't you do that? I think that'll probably be the easiest for people. Yes. The polling is anonymous, so even though there are just five of you responding to the polling, it'll be kind of consolidated with uh, polling results and all the data that we're collecting from other groups we're talking with as well. Please ask us questions along the way if you need any more information about any of this, and um, we will get back to you at your August meeting with some preliminary recommendations that comes from all of these discussions as well as how we've incorporated your input into this plan of action for regional transit. So if we could go to the next slide. Has everybody got the code? Are you in Menti, Mentimeter for the polling? Kevin says yes, a thumbs up from Well, what's the code? It's Because it says, it, I mean, I, it's got to enter the code, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, that's there. And I put submit and it says, Put a code in so that I don't understand. Our code, our code here is 1350 oh. 3313. Um, three, and I also three, put the link in the chat. One three five what? One three five zero three three one three. And you should get a first question to pop up. And I'll switch over to Mentimeter now. It looks like a few answers are coming in. This is kind of testing to see if it's working for everyone. I want to know what's the, which of the following is the question describes, best describes the place where you live. And it'll tell you who's answering. And so now we have five responses. Thank you very much. It's working. Great. Looks like everybody's on. Let's go to another easy one. This helps us kind of level set with where folks are with how they get around, which is part of the conversation. So a lot of this will be about how you use public transit or don't use public transit. So do you have a car available to you is the next question on your phones. Thanks for just deploying your phones for this purpose. Appreciate it. All right, great. So Sam will take us back to the, the other deck. We're gonna be flipping back and forth between the Mentimeter and uh, this deck. So here's a map of the seven counties of Northeastern Illinois. It's a big and complex region. This is not a map of Illinois, but rather it is a map of where two thirds of the state of Illinois lives in these seven counties. We have aging infrastructure, new technologies, rural and urban communities, in a broad-based economy, but with some barriers to access to jobs and opportunity. Uh, the interactive map shows you where all these municipalities are, and of the 284, only one of which is Chicago. So again, two-thirds of the state of Illinois lives in northeastern Illinois. To the next slide, we have a, a pretty impressive, extraordinary legacy transportation system with federal roads, bridges, miles of rail lines, rail crossings, and metro stations. And all of these systems, this infrastructure, is part of an interdependent regional economy that, that generates every year over $665 billion as our gross regional product. So it is a complex region with a complex legacy transportation infrastructure that requires investment to maintain it. So when we talk about public transit in the next slide, let's make sure we all know what we're talking about. Our public transit system that's operated by different boards. So we have the pace suburban buses and paratransit, CTA buses and trains, the L, Metro commuter lines, considered a commuter line, but a lot of people still use Metro for non-commuting purposes, such as events, and the South Shore line, which is also seen as more of a, a commuter line. So this is what we talk about when we talk about a public transit system. And each one of these is operated by a different service board under the umbrella of the Regional Transit Authority. So let's go to Mentimeter again for the next question. The question is, you may be seeing it already on your phone. 
is which modes of transportation do you currently use most often? Select up to four. Do you drive or ride the car? Do you walk or roll? Um, that would be wheelchair ambulation. Do you use public trains or commuter, public buses, taxi, ride share, bike, e-bike or scooter, motorcycle, paratransit or others? So you can select, select up to four as the modes of transportation you use most often. So we know that the pandemic, here's an aside for you, caused significant changes in how people get around and use public transportation. Uh, with more people needing to work from home and continuing to work from home, fewer road, trains and buses and public ridership, transit ridership declined and won't return to pre-pandemic levels. So right now we're at about 67% of where we were in 2019 with ridership across all three main services, public transit services. Um, but ridership alone is not the only measure of public transit value. We want to explore other ways in which public transit benefits the region and people who don't even use public transit. And public transit, as we know, continues to be important for people and essential workers making those essential trips. I'm sorry, Aditya. Yeah, how does it compare to VMT recovery or ex has it exceeded? Is it below pre-pandemic? Uh, we're looking right now if, if the congestion on our roads is any, any indication that uh, car traffic has recovered um, and people are not on trains and buses as much as they were, but the congestion numbers tell us that people are back in their cars and That's slowing true. down in their cars. Uh, it's, the roads are becoming more congested if, not, congested, if not more so than they were in 2019. A lot of that has to do with uh, construction. <laughs> Tis the season, huh? Tis the season. Um, here's a, here's a, off, uh, a question for you. If the pandemic affected how you get around, how did it affect how you chose to get around during the pandemic? Any thoughts here? Okay, hey, we can go to the next question. Next question is kind of a fun one, and, and I'd like you to uh, put yourself in the future, say 27 years to the year 2050, and all things being equal, cost-wise, accessibility, and anything possible, how would you prefer to get around now or in the future? We threw in a couple of fun things here that we hear from uh, folks who will be, let's say, in their mid-40s by the year 2050, and they're thinking about uh, hoverboards or personal tricopters, but share with us how you would prefer to get around. And I mentioned right. you can choose up to three. Yeah, Kevin. What was what was the question <clears throat> that you posed just before? I was I was looking for it on the mentee. Nah, and, it's, it was a different question. Kind of more for discussion is is how did how did the last three years affect how you chose to get around and have those choices? Has the pandemic affected how you choose to get around now for the long term? Do you think differently about mobility now? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it dissuaded people from doing things where they were, I mean, during the pandemic, where they were get exposed to other people. Uh, so I think more people to try, you know, basically, well, to the extent that they were out and about, uh, they used their cars or they walked or whatever the case may be, or maybe bike. But I mean, but people, I think people, and that's part of the issue that they think they stopped using public transportation because of the exposure to other people, uh, or they certainly used it less, mm -hmm. uh, even though sometimes with masks and so forth. Uh, and therefore, I think that's the hurdle. Uh, and, well, plus, I think it's changed the whole pandemic, has changed the pattern, the work pattern of a lot of, uh, of, a lot of people of the pandemic, which means there are more people working from home uh, or and either yep. intentionally or by choice of their employer. 
Uh, I think as a result of people have just done ways to avoid, uh, I mean, they don't go, they don't commute. <laughs> so you, got, you, can't have as, you can't have as many commuters if people uh, are commuting. <laughs> we've got actually some data for you in a few slides. Yeah, the other thing to, to mm -hmm. pivot off of that um, yeah. from Elliot, you know, I could see there being just personally for us in our household, one commuting primarily when they were in the office downtown by Metra, and now they're largely remote. I pretty much have been relying on a vehicle, a car the whole time. And, uh, you know, the, the reduction in traffic initially, you know, made the commuting uh, by car so quick, right? And I think coupled with, you know, some people, well, not wanting to get on public transit, even though there were those options to get in the car. And boy, this is a, I have yeah. the control over my time and, you know, I can get in and out quickly. And, uh, you know, so maybe they stay, maybe some stayed on the road. And, you know, like you said, we may even be past the uh, traffic volume now on the roads, right, that we that we had been at. So that's more than potentially more than recovered. So it, it's just an interesting dynamic there. Yeah. I think what we're knowing now is that things have shifted altogether and we're not going back to the way they were in 2019. Let's go to the next question. We got one more question before back to the presentation. If you use public transit, including paratransit, CTA, train, bus, metro, pace, how often do you use it? This is for discussion, not on the Metro. Oh. This is on the Mentimeter. Oh, it's on, on the, the Mentimeter. Okay. Yeah, we're, oh, okay, we're looking okay, to know what the folks we're talking with, um, uh, how frequently do they use public transit? And, and this is at this moment in time. Thank you, Renee, I see your comment. Can you explain, Renee, what you mean? Uh, well, as a biker, I <laughs> uh, commuting to work. If it's nice out, I bike all the time, but if it's not, then I'm doing something else. But I did, I answered it for, now today for Beautiful your day. best guess okay great yeah. is there someone who hasn't answered yet here we're looking for five responses uh there we go great so everybody here uses public transit with some re regularity well, maybe something that we can all agree on is that uh, we need public transit for quality of life. Public transit connects people to jobs, to educational opportunity, to training, to healthcare, to essential services. Uh, it provides benefits for people who don't even ride public transit because it takes cars off the roads, which means less congestion for people who choose to drive. By taking more cars off the roads too, it also has benefits for everybody in helping to improve our air quality with fewer greenhouse gas emissions. If we can, if transit can move more people off the roads and into trains and buses, it means it has lots of benefits all around. And for many residents, as you know, uh, public transit is their only affordable or accessible option for getting around. So um, kind of a, um, an assumption that we're making in this project is that we need public transit. The question will be, uh, what will it look like in the future and how do we pay for it? Let's go to the next question and to get your sense, take your temperature on some of these issues about the benefits of public transit. Back to Mentimeter, the, question, the next question is, and it's on a scale here, is how important is the regional transit system for reducing the number of cars on our roads? And this is how, often, how important do you think it is? Glad to see Mentimeter is working for you all. Great. Let's go to the next question, similar to this one. Looks like we're all agreeing on this. Uh, how important do you think, how important do you think the regional transit system is for improving air quality in our region?
These may be obvious, uh, but we're not getting similar answers everywhere we go. Great, we've got five answers. What's the next slide? It's a, another question. But one thing we do know is that public transit is important to the regional economy. And here's some of that data on this. It may surprise you to know that 87% uh, of trips on public transit have a direct impact on the local economy, on the regional economy. Uh, there are benefits to the whole region, there are benefits to creating jobs, and there are benefits actually to individual families. Um, so this gives you some of the economic benefits just from public transit usage, and we're happy to provide you with more information or the backup on any of this data if you need, if you'd like. So the next question may be, may be an obvious one for you, back to Mentimeter, is how important do you think the regional transit system is for supporting economic growth and jobs. Aditya, we will get that to you. And again, these, those estimates were conservative and just a baseline. Five answers in, great. Thank you. So th this is what we were hinting at before is that uh, remote work, uh, looking into the future, our estimates for 2030 tell us that well before in 2019, we were guessing that by 2030, maybe six to 8% of people would be telecommuting. Post COVID though, we think it's almost a quarter of workers will at least have the option to telecommute. And that changes a lot of things. There are implications for a lot. And it also affects how people use our public transit system. It'll play out in interesting ways in this region um, and with lots of implications. But what we do know, some of this is the next slide. What we did learn is that many, many of these jobs in our region cannot be done remotely. So for people in manufacturing, healthcare, food service, hospitality, public safety, remote work is uncommon or really just not possible. So for public, for public transit, there will always be people who need to use public transit, who rely upon it to get to work or get to opportunities and won't have the option to work from home. So the next question, is there another slide here? Thinking there is. After this, Sema, thank you. Sema's working two slides. So she's she's doing the ultimate juggling right now. Much appreciated. That actually is a question. It is a okay. question. So I'm gonna go back to Mentimeter. Great. And again, this is an obvious question with this information is about how important do you think the regional transit system is for giving people access to opportunities such as jobs, school, training? And this is another scale. And I mentioned earlier that all of this data gets folded in with data we're collecting from other groups we're talking to. And this will go into our report and recommendations to the Illinois General Assembly, which we hope will guide their development of legislation to address some of the challenges that we're seeing that we will explain. The one thing I was gonna say is, I think ironically or sadly, so to speak, the people who need it most, in other words, those people who are going to be more likely to need public transportation to get to work, people who don't have the ability or the, whatever they're doing doesn't lend itself to telework. I think that public transit is less accessible to them in two realms. One, physically, in terms of having okay. it near, near and nearby. And two, the economic hurdle of, uh, of dealing with, with public transit. So I, think, so, I, so, I think, so I think, ironically, the people who, who 
need it the most to get the work don't have it near them or they can't afford it. And they think that's a, which is obviously a big hurdle uh, because you got to create the system and you got to pay for it and you got to make it affordable. So that's a yeah. pretty big, that's a pretty big hurdle. And often where the jobs are is not, are not where the affordable housing is in our region. So there's that disconnect too mm -hmm. in excess. Tessa, you want to share something? Yeah, if I could just also add too, I don't think that there is always a proper outlet for those groups to be able to share and vocalize that all the time as well. And I think that that yeah. is, is a trending issue. Appreciate that, thank you. Some of you have jumped into the next question, which is what to use public transit for? Or you can choose all that apply. Uh, we learned from Metra, when, when you look at the options here about using public transit to say, go to special events, uh, can you guess what the highest ridership days are for Metra in a year? If you ride Metra, you might know. Fourth of July, something along that. Fourteen of fireworks. Fourteen of us. It's Lollapalooza. Lollapalooza. Lollapalooza yeah. are days when the Metro trains are packed. Those are their highest ridership days. And what we're seeing now, some of the trends are, is that people are using, uh, uh, that weekends are seeing a lot of Metro ridership because people just don't want to navigate, especially with the, the Kennedy under construction. And you've seen the Metro ridership on the UP Northwest and Union Pacific North lines go up. There was a story just this week or last week about this because of the construction on the expressway. And so people are finding their way back to public transit as again, an essential service. There's another interesting thing about that is public transit in many areas don't, off, they offer, or most of, most, most public transit offers less alternatives uh, for, for that weekend use when a lot of people wanna use it, it's not there. Uh, mm -hmm. I, th I think of the uh, the north north uh, sort of line to like this the, the line that goes to Buffalo Grove. I mean, there's virtually no weekend service. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, and, and that's a that, and a, a perfect example of that. People could and should uh, use it to probably go to O'Hare Airport, and these are people who, but and a lot of those people would need to do it on the weekends. Well. It's not available on the weekends, so, I, so I think that's an I think that's another another uh, fact mm -hmm. that when a lot of people need it, it's not there. So we are, in fact, Elliot, looking into uh, among the recommendations is uh, the idea of changing how how we approach the commuter train lines and their service levels and thinking about a regional rail system like in European countries where trains predictably come every 15 minutes rather than based upon a rush hour schedule, which obviously given the shifts in how we're working now, um, we may not need a commuter train line that's based upon just the rush hour morning and evening because people are using both public transit and our commuter lines outside of just rush hour more now, including the I, weekends for events. Yeah, I think yeah. that's a valid, quite a valid point uh, because a lot of people don't, goes back to what Kevin said uh, earlier. Well, I want to pick and go when I want as quickly as, as I want. Well, a lot of people don't want to be a slave to the schedule. They want to say, well, okay, if I want to go, I, you know, I can't go when I want to go. Or I'm locked in. I got to go earlier. I got to go later. Or I got. Or I got to waste all this time waiting around till the next train for a number of hours, or whatever the case may be. So I think that's another. Uh, I think that's another issue. Yep, Renee. Yeah, I just want to share my experience. So um, I started working downtown in November for the first time in the 15 years I lived in Chicago. And before, I always took the bus or bike or uh, to work. I have actually found the train very reliable <laughs> um, commuting Which train? in downtown. Uh, Red Line from Berwyn to um, Chicago. It was surprising hearing everything that I'd heard in the media and from people about just how bad the trains were. I generally feel safe on the train. 
I mean, they're kind of gross sometimes, but you know, it is public transit. And I take the train over the bus because I find the train more reliable. It's a train more reliable and less crowded. Um, so it's, it was interesting. I've had issues with outside of commute times with the trains not being as reliable, but during commute times, like there's a lot of people, it's not too crowded and they're reliable for the red line at least. Great. Good to know. Thank you, Renee. All right. The next question, kind of a follow-up. How would you rate the public transit in your community? Given that you all use public transit, I'm guessing I'm guessing where the answers are going to be. All right, great. Some poor public transit options, mostly good. Okay. Great. Any thoughts here, comments? So we can move on to the next question. Well, for us in Woodstock, yeah. you know, yeah. you're either you're either taking uh, at distance, you're you're either going downtown or or, or not, right? You know, it's yeah. it's not practical. You know, the hub and spoke type thing. It's not practical to get to another suburb to the yeah. west or north. Um, going downtown and back out. And then locally, there is the pay system. Um, but I, you know, it's not really hyper locally focused, right? It's going from one community in McHenry County, you know, you, you go five or 10 miles through the cornfields or whatnot, connecting with the next community. Um, so to me, it's, uh, again, it, it might get you from one city to another, but it's, in terms of going around through neighborhoods in the town, you know, nothing like that. Yeah. Well, that's another Kevin's point there is another valid one. Uh, I think there may be some validity to re re exploring uh, the in some fashion the concept of if you if, I don't know if you recall the star line concept mm -hmm. that was the that was the that was the suburb to suburb uh, concept uh, and actually was one of the thoughts that I had connection with the Bears project, for example, I think could be not a, not, not a burden, but an opportunity for saying, wait a minute, maybe we should be doing more in terms of suburban uh, to suburban uh, or uh, the connectivity for jobs and for access to other, you know, shopping, recreation, Mm -hmm. I mean, for example, if you had, and we don't really have it in here now, but but I but in terms of a, because we don't have it significantly in the Chicago area, but what you know, electric light rail, uh, which other places have, and probably is something that should be part of the part of the picture, uh, connecting Schaumburg to Arlington Heights and Arlington Heights to Waukegan, uh, uh, and actually you have. You have right away, which I think is a crime not to utilize, as opposed to turning it over to the Department of Natural Resources in and of itself, to use that right away possibly for light rail, uh, to use that mm -hmm. connectivity. Uh, there's going to be a casino. People in people in Waukegan can't get the jobs in Schaumburg, where there was a big, was a big focus of jobs. There's no way for there, there's no easy way for them to get there. But if in fact you had that connectivity. Uh, uh, that just that's just two, that's two different spokes. Arlington Heights to to Schaumburg and Schaum and Arlington Heights to Waukegan. That that in itself would be a, ma a major boon for that. And, and there's probably other and in other regions. Those are the ones that jump out to me because mm -hmm. this 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 northern region. Uh, but in the, but there's probably other connectivity that could be done. But I think that's a that's something that it's sort of because of expense. But if the question if there's a way to figure out how to make it more uh economic uh that something that i think it should be put back on the table in terms of transit uh because it's a sort of if you want people to use public transit you got to make it uh work for jobs and access to where people want to go uh, the project right now is focusing uh, in a good way on improving and expanding bus services, pace bus services in the suburbs, just for that reason, which is to connect communities that aren't on the hub and spokes transportation system right now, which 
as you said, you can move in and out of Chicago uh, pretty easily, but it's the wheel of that hub and spoke system. Um, so we're looking at ways to make those connections. Yeah, I guess well, that's the other, the, the, like I'm for sorry. example, where the buses utilize the, the right of way uh, or the, on, yeah. the, on the expressways, on you, can, the, you can, the shoulder, uh, mm -hmm. because obviously one of the reasons people don't like buses is the stop and starting and, and how long it takes and, and so on and so forth, I'm stuck in traffic. Whereas if you had more ability for public transit to use things like the shoulder approach or otherwise, uh, I think that could contribute positively to that. I guess also right. on yeah. that point in terms of like if we look at, for example, like Toronto, which has a very robust bus system in the suburbs um, every 15 minutes or so on those big um, bus services, reliable, maybe not as much coverage as some people might like here. Um, but those ridership numbers tend to look quite good. Um, and also kind of focus on kind of what Elliot was mentioning, kind of using right of ways or kind of bus prioritization signals. Um, I think everyone's been frustrated just being in a bus and seeing everyone go past you, even someone who's walking that's going faster than you. Um, so, and I think that's also like also helps kind of from a labor standpoint as well. If you can get buses moving faster, then you can either increase service with the same amount of people or just reduce the number of people. Um, and so those measures seem like um, a little bit more, probably more achievable at this point, um, but also greatly expand service. Right. Thank you, Aditya. Thank you, Elliot. Our next questions, a couple of you have already jumped on. Um, Back on Mentimeter, if a train or bus in your community were no longer available, how would this affect your ability to get where you need to go? Would you lose all transportation options? Could you use another? Or would you have to uh, rely on one that was more difficult, unreliable, or expensive? Or would it not affect you at all? Great, thank you. Let's go to the next one. And we've kind of danced around this a bit. Um, what improvements to CTA Metro and pay services would be most valuable to you? The next question I'll give you a preview is about which improvements would be most valuable to others. But for this one, which improvements would be most valuable to you? Frequency of service, faster, more reliable trains, buses, reduced fares, more transit options, discounted fares when transferring, improved access for people with limited mobility, and choose three if you would. And I wanna ask you too, as kind of a follow-up to this polling question is, where else do you see room for improvements? I can also just more housing developments in areas that have that transit access. Um, I think especially if you see in the suburbs, you have like these relatively well trafficked metro stations that are just seas of just parking lots, um, especially if remote work is still a thing. Um, maybe there doesn't need to be as many parking spots and that could be more housing for people who will naturally just go ahead and use that since it's right there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Other thoughts here? I think it's, you know, out, out in the, in, on the Northwest line in Woodstock, we've been yeah. looking forward to that potential relocation of a rail yard for Metra. And the primary reason would be more, more options, more frequency, so. I'll add more integration. So making it easier to take your bike on trains and buses, making it easier to go from CTA to Metra. They're doing that like combo pass thing, I think I read. Mm -hmm. So just like more integration between the sustainable modes that are available to you. Right. 
trains on Metra and South Shoreline too, making that easier. Yep. Her capping might also be interesting, just so people don't have to think as much. I think sometimes when I'm trying to think, there's like a cap. I you do like the math, the calculation in your head, like what should I do, how much should I buy, and maybe just some sort of fair capping scheme could also be just reduce that mental load. So some fair integration. Yeah, I think fair integration, fair yeah. capping. I think fair I capping. Think, uh -huh. Like, for example, I think in New York now, like, if you exceed some number of trips um, in a week, then you just are charged the um, weekly pass rate or something like that. Because mm -hmm. um, I think sometimes people are like, oh, how much should I should I buy a monthly pass, a ten ride pass, and that just I think it ends up causing more confusion than maybe what's worth. So make it easier for people to make the calculations to decide in favor of using public transit rather than defaulting to a car if they have that option. I think it's also just like letting the system, like I think, for example, I think how they do it in New York is like at the beginning of the week, like it, it resets and you just pay as you normally would on with your card. And if you exceed, for example, the amount of times that would take to buy a weekly pass, then you wouldn't be charged additional um, for those um, interests. So imagine if it takes 10 rides to equal one week week pass, then mm -hmm. if you do 11, 12, you won't be charged extra for that. Great, thank you, great ideas. Anything else here? All right, let's go to the next question. Similar to that, uh, what improvements to CTA, Metra and PACE services would, do you think would be most valuable to others? In addition to what you've already mentioned, is there anything, if you're looking at it from the perspective of community users, would you suggest any other improvements? Right. Mentimeter is very colorful, Sema. It's gone. All right, is everybody, is everybody answered? Maybe waiting for one more. Okay. Great, thank you. Here's where we get to some of the, the hard news, the hard bad news. So this is how we pay for operating the public transit system in Northeastern Illinois. About 40% of it is sales tax levied by the RTA, Regional Transit Authority. That's in the light blue. The green is what we call system generated revenue. Those are fares paid by riders mostly. Uh, public transportation fund and some state money, some Chicago real estate transfer tax accounts for some portion of it. And for the last three years, federal relief due to COVID has made up 21% of the budget for how we operate, how we pay for operating our public transit system. The bad news is, is that- It's gonna be gone. It, it, pardon? It's gonna be gone. Yeah, yeah. And compared to other major metropolitan transit systems, we rely disproportionately on system generated revenue or rider fares to support operations. In other places, they have, they have other sources of funding uh, that account for larger amounts than, um, than we do. State law requires us uh, pre-COVID for 50% of our system operating revenue to be generated by rider fares. We've gotten, um, uh, the state's eased up on that requirement, obviously, the last three years. They're looking at easing up on it permanently. But the hard part here is that the federal relief runs out in 2026. And uh, we don't right now have a way to make up that 20% in funding because the ridership is not going to take care of it all. So if you go this to maybe the process, next. Right? I'm sorry, go ahead. It's just operation. It's just operation. This is for operating. This is for operating. So, so the capital investments, there are sources of funding for capital investments. This is just the operating revenue, keeping the trains and buses going. 
And in 2025, that's where the federal funding goes away and we start dealing with and, and looking at a significant gap. And by 2026, we'll, we're looking at $732 million in a gap in what, it, what we have to run the systems. So um, this is the fiscal cliff that we're looking at. Uh, and the region has built this public transit system. It's the envy of ma other major metropolitan regions, but we, and we depend on it to do many things, get us to jobs, reduce congestion, improve air quality. Uh, the system is not perfect, but to maintain it, we're going to have to figure something out. And, and there's no magic wand here to solve this challenge. You can't cut the transit service because that'll decrease ridership, will, which will further decrease transit revenues. It's kind of a vicious cycle, resulting in more cuts to transit. And we know that these are essential services. This is not like running a business. So we can't do that to save costs. And what will it look like if we're cutting 20%? So essentially that federal amount of 20%, what happens if we cut it, uh, those operating expenses? Well, it will result in about a 40% cut in service itself. And hypothetically, this is where we might lose the service. So we would stop all service on the CTA's yellow, purple, green, and brown lines. We'd have to stop service, hypothetically, on Metro's Heritage Corridor, North Central Service, Southwest Service, those are the big red lines that you see, and eliminating up to 90 CTA bus routes and 70 PACE bus routes. So we'd have cities and towns and villages from Schaumburg to Elgin and Joliet that would lose Metro services. 20 Chicago neighborhoods and suburban communities would lose access to CTA train services. And again, hundreds of thousands of people who rely on public transit right now uh, would no longer have access to public transit in a way to get around, including paratransit services. So uh, a 20% cut in the operating revenue and the operating budget results in a 40% loss in services, which has real impact on Northeastern Illinois. Again, hypothetically, and these are our conservative estimates about what the implications would be. We've, with our steering committee on this project, looked at developing some, um, some recommendations uh, for solutions. And uh, the solutions are not easy. It will involve some hard choices that we'll be making all around. And again, there's no magic. If I wish I had a magic wand, it could, could uh, fix it all, but that's just not possible. We'll, we'll require multiple approaches to create new sources of revenue to operate the transit system. Our transit system is already operating pretty leanly. So there's not a lot of room to find more efficiencies in how we do it, except perhaps with some of the governance structure. As we look at developing this report and the recommendations, we are making some assumptions about what, what the principles are, is that we're going to try to ensure that the system is financially viable beyond 2026 when the federal relief runs out. We're going to help the state, the Illinois General Assembly identify ways and the roles that it can play in shoring up the public transit system for Northeastern Illinois. Ideally, we rebuild a system that is more modern, that uh, we make the investments so that it is bigger and better in ways that are more responsive to the users of the system. So we talked about everything from expanding bus routes to connect sub suburbs. We talked about uh, ways in which we can uh, do the fare integration. Again, thinking about how people use the system and how it's going to work better for them. And the Illinois General Assembly, at least the sponsors of the bill that asked us to produce the report have asked us to be um, big and bold in these recommendations. So everything is kind of on the table with this. I'm sorry, Ditya, thank you for your comment here uh, about the uh, question about changing labor costs. I don't know. And we can, we can get back to you with an answer to your question about how this might affect labor costs. Uh, we did a focus group earlier this week uh, at the Chicago Federal Federation of Labor with representatives from a number of labor organizations, and they were equally concerned not just about how their members move around and get to jobs, but also the people who work for the service boards for PACE, Metra, and the CTA, and what this might mean for them. Yeah, I guess like yeah, expanding on that, like if we were to move to more consistent 
scheduling, so not as peak heavy on our trains and buses. And maybe those are spread out throughout the day a little more evenly. I imagine our staffing would also be able to be smooth more evenly and less very peak heavy, which is the peak heavy scheduling is quite expensive, if I'm not mistaken, versus a more consistent scheduling. Mm -hmm. I'm curious you. if there's any work looking at how changing that would impact. Again, probably no change in like number of workers, but people having more consistent schedules, um, plus of these weird dead hand times in between um, those peaks. Okay, great. We can we can look into that and get back to you. your questions whether or not there would be some savings in labor costs if we smooth the service schedules out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And another thing that occurs yeah. to me that, uh, and obviously this is a you know when times you talk about taxes well, of any kind on anybody, uh, it also raises the labor standard. But I'm trying to think of the practical issue here if you have companies manufacturers or other who need people to get to their places of work should you know i mean and is, is there a way that those people should be paying i know it's contributing i mean some type of whatever you know computer tax that that would go on determine how to do that so that and obviously that gets all passed on. So it's all, it becomes very complicated. Uh, but is there is there a way for, you know, sort of a public private partnership, so to speak, uh, in terms of putting some burden on business who profit, who basically they're generating profit by whatever they're, whatever they're doing and they need people to do it. Uh, Cause those are the people that are, that are labor intensive. Should they be contributing to the cost of the system that gets people that they need to their places mm -hmm. of business. I mean, I don't have any, you know, it's that it's complicated, but I'm just thinking out loud, you know. Yep. Thank you, Ellie. And Tess, I'm sorry, I missed your question, uh, which was, do we have any projections estimates for the potential Metro City surcharge that uh, Mayor Electric Johnson proposed? I don't. Well, didn't he back off of that, or is he, is he revived it? I don't think he backed off of it, but I don't think anything, I mean, nothing's happened with it, so obviously well, it couldn't yet, but like, I wasn't sure. I just know that that was discussed, okay. so I was just curious. Don't know. We can get back to you on that one. So we'd like to take your temperature on some of the the hard options for finding ways to build a financially sustainable public transit system. We're back to Mentimeter for this. We're discussing a lot of options and these are just some of them. Mind you, there are lots of other ways and these are all complicated and sometimes interacting, um, but I think we all agree that we must raise more funds for transit operations, that 20% that goes away. And which of the following might you support? Uh, so these are ways to rank those things that you could support um, and select all that apply. So uh, to explain a little more, uh, uh, higher toll on expressways, that is, do we increase the, the toll roads, tolling on cars using the toll roads? Uh, do we increase fares for people who use public transit? Do we tax services? A lot of other states tax services. Illinois does not. Do we start a new tax on services to fund transportation? There is a connection there similar to what Elliot's comment just was on um, uh, the public transit supports a lot of businesses, including service businesses. Uh, so there's an economic nexus there. Uh, do we want to Increased state registration fees, that could be a drop in the bucket compared to $730 million that we need to raise in just one year. Um, increase the gas tax. We can increase the gas tax, but with the increase of more electric vehicles on the roads, um, that is itself going to be declining. Or do we simply increase the uh, uh, sales tax rate on all goods? Or none of these. So if you would What's rank- yeah, I'm what's sorry, an example ahead. of a what's an example of a currently untaxed service? 
So generally, we some of the services would be everything from landscaping fees to um, barber shops to oh, okay. uh, I get it. you know they use accounting, lawyers' fees, those kinds of things that uh, are currently not taxed in Illinois. Does that help? Dry cleaning, vehicle maintenance, those services. Has there ever been any consideration about congestion taxing in? The CPD in uh, downtown Chicago congestion yeah. tracing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, New York finally got approval to implement better use. Mm -hmm. Which I you don't have in in here. Yeah, uh, but it's the the whole you know have the vehicle miles traveled concept. You know that's mm -hmm. not yeah that's not that's not that's not in here. Uh, I know we had some discussions way back when at CMAP about that and had some programs mm -hmm. about it. what's been the pilot programs that's gone on in Oregon or elsewhere. Yep. Uh, that's, you know, and obviously I know that a lot of, there was a lot of uproar of people were sort of, oh, that's, well, we can't do that. And people were real upset about it. There was a lot of pushback when the concept even emerged. Uh, but considering the the move to electrical vehicles, which will which will increase, I mean, without a doubt, uh, as time goes as time goes by, the gas tax concept is really going to be, you know, a, an outdated concept in terms of uh, gender because it's going to keep going down and down. Uh, mm -hmm. So just raising it is not going to necessarily uh deal with the problem yep yep understood so i'm making notes if you have other ideas um we'd like to include them again we ran out of room on one mentimeter polling question to add all the options that are right now being discussed but wanted to as i said take your temperature on some of these that are harder renee um i'm a fan of speeding tickets and red light cameras. I know they're controversial, but they make me feel safer and are a revenue source. There's also talk of doing tolling on North Lakeshore Drive as part of the Redefine the Drive project as well. Um, so that would be a potential source as well. Thank you. Noted. Would you be willing to pay higher transit fares for better service? Or what's your sense? Either you or what's your sense of others? I Are personally defining... would be fine with it, but I wouldn't want to like place a burden on people that couldn't. So maybe more of a graduated or uh, sliding scale type thing or something. I guess what do you mean by better, like higher frequency, um, less congestion? What is that? Yeah, I think that would I think that would be tied to what people were getting. I don't I don't think people would be receptive to it generally. Mm -hmm. I think I think that I th I think that would be if you want people. The whole idea is we got to figure out a way to get people to use it uh, to use more public and and part of it there there may be. Uh, and obviously, it's always a everything's always goes back to educating the public, but there may need to be a comprehensive public education project, so to speak, yeah. uh, to better educate the public on why we should be doing this and why people should be using public tra public transit and so forth. I mean, that's not necessarily everybody's got to listen, uh, but it's certainly. Uh, I think if people could appreciate the value, uh, but but it, but once again, it goes back to what they're getting. So you've got to have a system that meets the needs of people. If you have a system that meets the needs of people, then you can promote it, and maybe people will will use it in greater in greater numbers. So it's there. It's all intertwined. You got to have a good system. Yep got to be affordable and 
you got to get a lot of people to use it. You know, like the, um, to me, a lot of this is like thinking about equitability too. And uh, I know that's a, a big part of, of, you know, what CMAP's about. And I'm thinking, you know, in terms of the, let's say the tolls were higher on, on the tollway, you know, are, are, are those the, uh, the people that are paying those tolls, are they, are they the ones who are going to be, you know, they should be on the commuter line instead heading downtown? Or again, are they going, you know, out to the other, you know, collar uh, suburbs or, 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 or uh, suburbs or whatnot? And, uh, you know, I, I could also see the, the, the downside to that being, you know, you're, we push people off those tollways and more onto those local roads and, you know, create more unsafe conditions in those places. But, oh my gosh, you know, again, what a, what a tough equation to put together here. Agreed. And ultimately it's the Illinois General Assembly that will be um, looking at policy options here and turning it into legislation at some point. So our job here is just to, uh, tap your experience and perspectives, develop some recommendations, and then turn it over to the General Assembly for those next steps. And that'll be in 2024. So uh, to get to then some of our next steps here, we've, we're, unless you have other thoughts on this, um, uh, we welcome your insights at any time. So if anything occurs to you once you, we've adjourned the meeting, please share them with SEMA and we will add them to the public comment that we're collecting and we'll turn into the report. I think at the August meeting would be a good time to check back with you on what the agency has done with its partners with the steering committee to develop a preliminary report in those recommendations and see how you feel about some of them. Again, we're really hoping we can be big and bold on this and it will just as the last three years have caused a major shift in how we get around, uh, we're hoping that this report will cause a major shift in how we look at public transit and its role and importance for the regional economy and all the other benefits. So any questions about this project or about the discussion we just had, anything else you wanna add? I think it's an important concept. I mean, the project is important. I think this was a valuable discussion uh to get us thinking about it yeah. uh obviously there's you know it's a complicated it's complicated because there's no easy answers uh but uh could, hopefully could, it's to be to be continued could you greater yeah. depth sorry can you that. send us copies of the slides yes could you recap to jane you know in terms of back within our local communities and organizations that we're a part of? Are there ways that we can engage others in this, you know, feedback and such? So we've got uh, right now, the way we're kind of developing the plan is we've got a steering committee with representatives, multidisciplinary uh, regional steering committee that meets once every two months. The next meeting is in two weeks and people are welcome to dial into that. It's a public meeting and can offer public comment. Uh, I, we can send you the link to the web page uh, of the, maybe some of you can do that now is just pop the link to the part web page. Uh, we will be providing updates in our newsletter. People wanna stay tuned in and uh, we are welcoming and inviting public comment at any time. So uh, you could do it through um, our website. You could do it through an email to SEMA if anybody wants to chime in on these things, they are really important. Um, our board. I was going to suggest that, yeah. that you maybe reach out. Well, obviously, to individual communities uh, to to get some of the input that, like like some of the things that we did today, mm -hmm. uh, uh, where I mean, some people have some communities have transportation commissions, uh, they're you know village boards, uh, or at a at a minimum. I would suggest that you maybe have a presentation on this report and and try and seek input on an interactive way, some, some similar to what we did, uh, and maybe with even in greater depth uh, through the Cogs. Yeah, uh, we I think are. The, Cogs, the Cogs would be a great would be a great uh, it would be this way. It would, it would actually it would be a great program for you know a monthly meeting for for all of the Cogs. 
I, I think you've read our mind um, that we are getting in front of each council of governments, council of mayors, transportation committee, or yes. the board themselves to share all of this and get their feedback at every step of the way. So uh, we're talking to lots of groups. Every time our um, executive director is out speaking, she's sharing information about this project, looking for insights together. So it's a it's been a conversation. It will be at every one of CMAP's external facing interactions between now and uh, probably September when we'll be finalizing the report for our board's approval. And I think the more outside people that are involved, yeah, uh, the better, because I think that this needs, well, it needs consensus. And to get consensus, yeah. you need to have tentacles out to the broader community as, as much as you possibly can. And uh, that makes that getting that input, I think, really critical. Agreed. And, and uh, one of the advantages we have is that the Regional Transit Authority uh, just published last fall their their um, uh, strategy, their long-term strategy, and it included a great deal of public input and public engagement. And so we're using all of that data as well to help guide the development of this report because it lines up quite well altogether. Uh, thank you for comments. Summit, thank you for posting these things. Aditya, thank you very much. Uh, we will definitely share that link. With, the, with our technical experts on this. So the timeline here is we'll come back to you in August with the August meeting with some more information or at least a briefing on where we are with this. And then it goes to uh, the CMAP board in our MPO policy committee for their approval at a joint meeting in October. And then we will be submitting it to the Illinois General Assembly before the end of the year. Our due date is January 1st, but probably before then. So if you have any questions, if you have anything, any more information that you need, please uh, send them to Sema. She's your best connection on all of this. And we will get back to you with the additional things you asked for, the, the copy of the slide deck for sure. If there's anything else that you need, please let Sema know. So Sema, turning it back over to you to kind of, I guess, bring this to a close. Thank you so much for all your input. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you. Dave. Thank you, I know we were waiting for Erin. I've never seen her show up, but I don't know if she was available or is that going to not happen? Yeah. So, well, thank you, Jane, first of all, for the presentation and all, to all of you for your great comments and feedback. And we're, we'll circle back with you on um, those questions that you had. And um, it seems that Erin is still on her way back to the office. So we'll go back to the agenda, Elliot. And if she doesn't join in time, hopefully we'll have her join our August meeting. So I'm going to go back to the agenda and we can if there, well, if there are any uh, additional items anybody has uh, to bring before the committee uh, is there any public comment obviously that's pretty difficult when the public's not here uh, yes there were no um, <laughs> comments received before the meeting and mm -hmm. we do not have and any our next uh, our next meeting is supposed to be August 8th barring some change. I can I, I can I share suspect. one thing before you close out. Oh, great, great. Um, the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District just uh, completed its climate action plan, um, just went out for a press release today. Um, been working on it for four years. Uh, the district's currently on track to meet their 2025 uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction goals. Um, I'm happy to send that to you if uh, anybody wants a copy of it, but it is out there. I'd love to see that, I'd love to see it. Thank you, Renee. We could share that too in our newsletter. We can do maybe a blurb okay. and get it out to our audiences too. Congratulations. Cool. Yeah. I yes, yeah, if you want to send that to me. Basically nothing to do with it, but I will take the I will take the congrats. <laughs> Thanks, Renee. Uh I the only other thing before we adjourn, I was just gonna suggest that uh there would be value to having some more people on this committee, I think. Uh and then uh, and then de then determining whether whether some other things we could or should be talking about i mean the time between our meetings is uh is rather long uh the, the lapses from meeting to meeting and i think that's something but obviously we've got there has to be stuff that's you know meaningful that we can that can all be talking about and sharing uh but i think having a uh having a uh a broader 
base of people from throughout the region, I think would be continue to be valuable. And I think we've got to figure out a way to do that. Yes, definitely. And we are, we do have vacancies. We are working on getting more folks to fill those spots. Um, so if you have any thoughts or suggestions or anyone you think might be great for the committee, please let me know and we can reach out and, and work on that. Very good. Uh, does anybody have anything else? If not, I would thank you all for being here and uh, giving of your time for uh, this morning. Uh, it's great seeing you all once again, and I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Thank you. All in favor, this meeting stands right. adjourned. Yeah. Thank you all so much. Thank you all very, very much. Take care now. Bye. -bye. Thank Good you. Night. Thank you, Seema.